Um, we are coming from a little bit of a different perspective in that um, we're seeing it, I guess, more from a customer perspective as opposed to a patient perspective, but we certainly see that they're very um, linked and, um, and over the next 15 or so minutes, um, we'll try to give you our perspective on things and also our perspective on things from the digital health um, industry and then how we see that it um, sort of might play out over the next sort of five to 10 years. Um, I'll just do the first couple of slides and then hand across to, to Pat, who uh, heads up all of our data and analytics um, and does an amazing job for us, um, making sure that our, our data is presented to our partners in a way that is really meaningful. So if we could have the first slide, Pat, that would be great. Um, as Cara mentioned, we were founded in 2014. Um, our mission is really simple. It's just to help people live a healthy life. And what we want to be able to do is to provide a trusted um, and love preventative um, health solutions for our, for our members to be able to live as healthy as a life as they possibly can and, and as independently as they possibly can. Um, SISU, uh, it always catches everyone out, Cara, so you're not the first, um, but it's, uh, it's pronounced SISU and it's a Finnish word. And, and we chose the word SISU because um, it means, it refers to resilience and strength. And certainly whenever you're trying to change your behaviour when it comes to, to health, we understand how difficult it is. So whether it's to you know, lose a few, um, a few kilograms of body weight, whether it's to give up smoking, whether it's to um, increase an exercise activity, we understand how difficult it is. So we, uh, we named the business SISU because it did resonate with us. Thanks, Pat. So just a really quick snapshot um, around the customer-facing aspects of our business. Um, what we wanted to be able to do is to capture data that was really meaningful and data that was going to be um, potentially pushed into the health system. Um, we, we were very enthusiastic about the health stations that exist in America. Um, we tried to encourage the Americans to come out to Australia and to the UK, but unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in doing that. So we had to become a manufacturer. We, we now manufacture the assisted health stations here in Victoria. Um, it took us around about four years to get Class 2A medical device certification on the health stations, but it was an investment we wanted to make to ensure that we had respect within the medical and academic um, world that the data coming off the station was, was going to be valuable, not only to the customer, but hopefully to the, to the population at wide. So the individual and basic free health check, um, it's very important for us as a business that the health um, check is free. It will continue to remain free. However, we are working on a subscription service um, for our members in such a way that they can get advanced um, health metrics on the health station and also on the platform. But we will continue to make sure that the health station is free. We've recently built a, a mini health station as well uh, to try to enhance the personalization. And I think that it was, uh, it was Len this morning who, who spoke a little bit about personalizing the offering. Um, and certainly from our elder popula elderly population and individuals um, with equity uh, issues, um, the mini health station has been very sort of um, popular and it's something that will continue to push for rural and remote communities. Once the individual does a health check, they get pushed into the portal or the app where they can track their data, hopefully for the rest of their life. Um, we would love to have interoperability in this country to be able to uh, push that data into the My Health Record, but we know all of the metrics that we actually capture um, don't have a home in My Health Record, but hopefully one day they will. We're part of the NHS Accelerator Program in the UK, um, and we see that there's some really great upsides for us to be able to push the data that we capture from our um, biometric health stations into the spine of the NHS, and fingers crossed that that will happen here in Australia over the next sort of five to 10 years. But the individual owns the data, um, we're the custodian of the data. Um, we ensure that we do everything in our power to be able to protect that data. But we wanted the individual to be able to come back and do a health check as often as they want. And it's up to us then to present that map, uh, data back to the customer in a manner that is really meaningful and in the future in a manner that they can share it with their GP, their physiotherapist, their pharmacist or their family. Once the individual um, has their results, we have a sophisticated communication engagement platform which allows us to push notifications and, and push um, recommendations to our customers based on their specific needs. So a 25-year-old lady um, living in Melbourne is going to get a different, um, a different message to a 55-year-old man living in Brisbane um, with different sort of health requirements. But what we want to be able to do is to personalise those mess messages and personalise those prompts and personalise those programs. One of our partners is uh, API um, Healthcare, which owns Priceline. Um, they're actually a... Um, an equity partner in our business uh, and as of Friday that we become West Farmers with the takeover of API from West Farmers. We have built a prescription service also which allows the customer to get a uh, prescription delivered to their home within 24 hours um, based off the data that we capture um, but that's an adjunct to the, the, uh, the product that we're going to be talking about today. Thanks Pat. 
very quickly in Australia alone, um, we have 300 public health um, stations. That means that we're touching around about 9.4 million people within five kilometres. That is our aim um, to get around about 2,500 health stations um, spread throughout Australia, um, particularly in rural and remote, so individuals can go and do their health check whenever they want and as often as they want. We've noticed a, a broad socioeconomic um, use and, and, and socio-demographic use, which Pat will touch on on our talk. Um, at the moment, we're working within retail workplaces and healthcare locations. We have a number of health stations in the UK, actually, in hospital settings, looking after the staff um, in a number of the hospitals throughout the UK. Um, we did have a drop in usage um, over COVID, which is to be expected because all retails, particularly pharmacists, had, had a drop. We're doing around about 25,000 health checks at the moment per month, but that is moving back up to the 50,000 health checks per month that we were doing pre-COVID. Um, we've invested significantly in the network, obviously, with hardware, um, and software, there's a significant investment that is required to be able to put the infrastructure down. Um, we're working hard to continually to enhance that, um, but we're really enthusiastic to, to work with everyone, to collaborate with everyone, to make sure that we can give the customer slash patient the best experience we possibly can. Um, we funded it ourselves um, to date. Um, we haven't received any sort of government funding. Um, we don't receive anything from an MBS item. We don't receive anything from a PBS item. Um, everything has been self-funded. What we have to do is, and again, following sort of from Wendy's point this morning, around making sure that everything is um, is, is designed, centred around the customer. We just have to make sure that the customer wants to pay um, for our service. Um, fingers crossed over the, in the future, um, we will be able to work with the government to be able to support as many people as we possibly can. Thanks, Pat. Uh, just the last slide for me uh, today before I hand over to Pat. Um, as Karen mentioned, we've done around about 4 million health checks. I think it's about 3.98 million health checks um, to date. Um, we've got around 1.5 million members and, and, and growing on a daily basis. Um, the NPS is, uh, is incredibly high at, at 63, and we're very proud of that. Um, we have great utilisation with men. Um, in my previous life, I had a, a business which was purely online, and we really struggled to engage men when it's purely online, but with a physical health station, um, we're able to engage men and encourage men to utilise it. So even within Priceline, um, which is uh, essentially 92% um, female um, utilisation, we have very high participation with male, which we're very proud about. And, of course, the other statistic which we're, we're proud of is um, encouraging individuals to go to their GP. Um, we would be enthusiastic to work with GPs in the same way that we work with pharmacies. We don't see it in any way that it's competing. Um, what we're doing is identifying individuals, whether it's with high blood pressure, high BMI, um, stress and anxiety, um, diabetes prevention, um, to be able to go to their GP and work collaboratively and hopefully um, enhance care programs for those individuals. We also have a service which is purely online, which doesn't involve the health station, um, and that's uh, up to 126,000 health risk assessments that are completed online. Quality and compliance is essential. It's an existential threat to our business if we ever um, do have an issue with um, not only our data, but also the quality of the metrics coming off our data. We spend a lot, we invest a lot, and we'll continue to invest a lot to ensure that the data that we um, provide our customers is at the highest quality, and hopefully we can share that with, uh, with other partners, um, certainly on this call today, as to how we might be able to collaborate in being able to ensure that that data is shared amongst as many of the groups that our customers would like to share. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Noel. Um, I'll take over from here. I hope that gives you a good overview of, of, of what SISU Health does and uh, what we're offering to not just the public here in Australia, but more generally in three other countries where we operate. I just want to briefly touch on revisiting the challenge and the problem in, in, in public and population health and why, from our perspective, that, you know, digital is no longer a nice to have. And I'm going to take you also through some fairly unique and incredible insights that have come off our network in Australia during the COVID period, which we're pretty certain are unique in the world and which we're currently working with University of Western Australia and Swinburne University um, to submit a paper to the Lancet um, in the coming weeks around what we're seeing, the data coming off that station. So just a brief reiteration, probably talking to um, the converted here, but obviously the current state is, from our perspective, unsustainable and, and, and really an existential threat. Um, chronic disease growth, um, the profile of growth is, is, is disturbing. It's not stopping, particularly in the area of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Um, we really haven't made significant inroads into cardiovascular disease. Obviously, there's been a lot of um, noise about it or, or news about it recently with, with Shane Warne and, and, and other people um, passing and succumbing to, to that disease. 
um, but a hell of a lot more needs to be done. And, and from that perspective, the way I often say it, Noel, is where we now see climate change and the efforts to, to change um, and to, 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 to make radical decisions around um, taxation and electrification of cars and things like that, the technological change to support um, reduced emissions is the same sort of impetus that I, I see um, population and preventive health because the, the tra trajectory we're on is ultimately unsustainable. Obviously, we're massively underinvested um, in prevention um, and certainly in Australia relative to the rest of the um, OECD. Um, and the economics of healthcare costs growing greater than GDP every year, you know, foretell a, a poor future. And I think the last point on that page is really important. Health equity and accessibility are, are key things of health, and we've seen them both here in the UK um, deteriorate over COVID, and I'll take you through some of that data shortly. Um, borrowing Mark, um, Professor Mark, not Prof Associate Professor Mark's um, slide and, and then that from the DHR, we really love this simplification of, of, of what's got to change and where the money's currently going. All we've done in this slide is really apply the data out of the AIHW's disease, disease expenditure data and, and show visibly what needs to move. We won't go into where things have got to meet, need to move, but um, obviously, you know, the apportionments have to change. The focus has to change if we're going to make a difference down the track for ourselves, for our children, and for their children. Um, just one example, obesity alone. I mean, a huge amount of money. Um, add that up with cardiovascular disease and other preventable illnesses, diseases. And, you know, the size of the prize here is enormous. And we also know that whether it be here or in the United Kingdom, the payback from investing in effective preventive health and population health is also enormous. So I've been in this with this company with, with Noel for, for, for nearly five years now, four and a half years. Obviously, he's been here from the beginning. Generically, we've learned a lot. And, you know, one of the key things that, you know, I, I reflect upon the, the space where we play is, you know, What's different and special about digital versus the current approaches and analog approaches to health? And, and the first one is scalability. You know, one of the things I look at when I look across our data across the nation is we've got a nationwide view of what's happening. A lot of that data in this country is siloed. We see it sporadically through national health surveys. We saw one last week through the NHS 2020-21, a very limited view of what's going on. And so that, that concept of scalability is critical. Um, when we look at the heart health check, we, we, we looked at that data a few weeks ago and in its first year pre-COVID, first full year pre-COVID, um, you know, reaching a very small percentage of the target population, the same in the, in the UK. Um, consumer centricity, the second point, is incredibly important. I think to win in health and to engage people, we've got to make the services and the people at the centre. So we don't use the word patient in our business. We use the word member or customer or user. Um, and, you know, one of those key things is that concept of empowering people by giving them access to their own data. We've applied the principles of the GDPR globally. So if you want that data deleted or ported in a machine-readable format, we will honour that request wherever you might be, even though it's not Australian law. Um, we've proven, and I think digital devices, we've proven that people actually trust and love these, the service. So, you know, plus 63 on 1.4 million responses is Frank's the idea that will people use, trust and love digital health devices? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the equity and accessibility one is, is crucial. Um, it's probably, it should be even higher up that list. Um, in the United Kingdom and here, we've got clear proof points around usage by minorities and lower SES, lower IMD and CIFA here in Australia, uh, quintiles and deciles. So quintiles one to four. Quintiles one to two, I should say, deciles one to four. Um, and in, in Australia with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So we over-index slightly um, usage by Aborig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here in Australia versus what their, their coverage is in the population. So it's a, a tremendous validation that there's something very special about that device. It's non-judgmental nature. It's accessibility to people who typically are disadvantaged, do not use health services regularly, um, and in some cases, do not want to use health services regularly. Um, the other thing, I guess, point five is measurability. You know, we've got this fantastic advantage digital of measuring over time and in real time um, to provide um, a very clear, definitive um, view of what's going on um, in society across the nation. 
and you'll see that shortly. Obviously, quality and accuracy are incredibly important parts of that. Um, we take that very seriously, as Noel mentioned. Persistence is a key concept too. You know, the able to be able to configure and, and create user journeys that persist, that can be tracked, that can be personalised and measured is incredibly important. And I guess the last point is probably the most ob obvious one is an economic one is, you know, the cost to serve for what we provide is, is, is clearly superior to all human to human methods. Um, and that integration piece is critical. So if we're going to do a great digital health check that's um, on a class 2A medical device, make sure that that data is managed securely and that data has a value that can be franked. So I will very quickly, just bear with me. I'm going to take you through very quickly through um, what we call the canary in the mind data. This is Sisu's view of what happened during COVID and still happening, I might add. Um, it's unique in the world. It comes from the stations during the COVID period and prior to COVID starting. So from January 2018, we take the data and we'll tell you some of the patterns that we've seen from the stations, which I say are machine measured and to the best of our knowledge, unique in the world. And that's why we'll be um, submitting this paper to the Lancet. Um, when COVID hit, you probably remember great anxiety, um, most of us home, working from home, um, wondering what was going to happen to the world. Um, by about, particularly here in Victoria, um, July 2020, the middle of winter, the middle of lockdowns, we started to notice an inflection. And the inflection, the first inflection we started to notice was a weight inflection. And we measure weight over time at the individual level, and then we aggregate it up at various levels. And weight loss and weight gain, from our perspective, has some strong seasonal um, aspects. And as you can see in the years prior with those two points, one, you know, the maximum amount of um, net weight lost for our members was round about in the March, February, March, April time of year after the summer. And usually there's a pattern of, 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 of coming back in when winter happens. What happened by June, July, August, as you can see up here, point two, is all of those gains start to dissipate as people start coming back onto the station and start gaining weight. We're now in a position where um, the pattern has been broken. Um, and it continues to be broken, as I'll show you on the next slide. Normally, we would have these shoots of green where we have net weight loss, a seasonality to it. We haven't seen that now for, you know, coming up to two years, 18 months. So something profound has happened in the population. And this might not be new news. We've all spoken about, you know, if I put a few kilos on here, I know I have. But to have a machine measured view of this um, is quite remarkable. Um, as you can see, we cut the data till the 28th yesterday, um, I said to one of my analysts, can I have a look at if it's changed, if there's any green shoots? And the answer is no. And while some of that weight gain has dissipated, there's still no green there. So this was the sort of the canary in the mind moment for us as a business to go, what's going on in other metrics that matter that we're measuring? And we did some other additional um, ways of looking at that weight loss um, at an individual level and other, other um, cohort level. Um, and the pattern is the same and it's been confirmed by our research partners. So I just briefly want to touch on what the, the stations have told us during COVID. And the, the headline story is that um, all key health risks that we measure have inflected upwards during the COVID period. Um, it's a real concern. This is a machine measured scale view, unlike any other in the country, certainly not the National Health Survey or any other um, figure of authority to come off those devices to tell us what's going on. And I'll just briefly take you through what it looks like. There's been weight gain, and particularly weight gain in, in risk BMI cohorts. And, and that's happened across age groups, as you can see here. And it's happened across C for D styles as well, nearly all C for D styles. With that, the OSD risk risk has, has, has risen as well, um, significantly. Um, when we look at high blood pressure, this is massively concerning. We've seen this very significant inflection upwards in 2020 and continuing in 2021. It's happened across the sexes. It's happened across all age groups. It's happened across all C for D styles. Smoking rates. We were the first to notice a um, very severe inflection in April 2020 in smoking rates, people declaring smoking that by smokers. And that rate has continued and that rate has continued across all of those other angles at which we look at smoking. And we were the first to, for, to note that. It took another peak health body more than 12 months to notice that there'd been this inflection upwards in smoking even though the actual volume of smokers, of, of cigarette smokers, has dropped 20%, Coles and Woolworths will tell you, the number of smokers has gone up and it's, and, it's, and it's maintained. We also measure perceived stress. 
to the PSS4 um, uh, stress instrument. And there's been a movement upwards um, on average across the board, but really specifically around female 16 to 44. So younger women, but also working mothers at home with children in lockdown. You can imagine what that looks like. And the other interesting thing is we've seen stress levels, perceived stress levels increase in, in middle to upper CIFA. So people with jobs working from home, so not typically the, the lower um, socio who already have elevated levels of perceived stress, um, but in the, in the middle class of Australia. And so all of these measures, when we look at them, whether we look at them by state, um, we've seen inflections upwards. There's only a few um, very rare examples where it hasn't happened. The only example where stress has not increased, according to our data, is in the ACT, um, which is fascinating. Um, and if you think about that, it's probably because you've got a high CFA population whose, popula whose employment for many is probably guaranteed by the government. So really interesting patterns um, that we're seeing in the data. And I think finally of this, of this data that I'm presenting here, um, we've been working with Swinburne University and the University of WA and Professor Marcus Schleich, who's um, preeminent in hypertension in this country, one in the world. And we provided our de-identified data for them to do some research analysis. And Marcus's PhD, Dr. Janis Nold, has concluded there's been a three millimetre mercury increase in, in blood pressure, systolic blood pressure over the COVID period. And you can see it here, this very steep inflection, which has been maintained. Um, you know, I, I say, I think the reason by that, and we'll come to it, is you've got a mass anxiety event. But the big, the big issue with this is um, even a two millimetre, um, two mm um, of mercury increase um, foretells a significant risk future risk in, in cardiovascular, bad cardiovascular events. So when people talk about long COVID, they typically talk about the symptoms associated with, you know, getting COVID. Um, there's something much more profound and equally as long-term happening in the health of the population. So that was our COVID view of the world. As I say, it's fairly unique in the world. And, and we've got a much larger report that we can share with you if you, if you want to reach out to us. There's a 70-page document there that we can we can share. I just, just to close that up, I just want to talk on what we've learned over the journey and what our five to 10 year vision looks like. First point, obviously with the COVID lens on is um, the pandemic has really highlighted the central importance of population preventive health. And that includes health literacy. Um, the concept of long COVID should ac accommodate a broader range of health risks, including mental health. Um, and the structure of scalability of, 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 of health services needs to be really looked at very closely because there's been bottlenecks as we know um, and we very much, I, I'm of the belief and our business is the belief that we need to push those services out to the people. And so we come back to what that solution looks like. We really strongly, absolutely believe that, you know, consumer-centric, consumer-first, system-integrated um, digital health services and infrastructure can transform population preventive health. It needs to be supported by um, new funding models and new incentivization models. Um, some of them might be radical, in the, in, similar to what, you know, what was released in superannuation in this country many, many decades ago. But, you know, in that grey area there, there is absolute um, possibility for transformation of those services. Um, and, in, and in providing services to people free of charge or for charge at a level of accessibility and equity of access that we've never seen before, of accuracy, and to provide national health surveillance on, on, on things like blood pressure, obesity, type 2 diabetes and other cardiovascular risks um, is a phenomenal um, opportunity. And to, just to close out, um, this is an example of what we're talking about. You know, this was a cardiometabolic um, health platform. We engage the population, we measure them, we score them. If they need to be referred to in an integrated manner to GPs and other health services, we do so. But then we provide a layer of persistent um, communications, nudges, programs and adherence programs, and we can measure it over time. Um, that doesn't exist in this country, but there's no technical reason why it can't. So that's why we're so bullish about, you know, what value um, digital health can bring to Australia. On that note, thank you for your time.